Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to um, the London Shipping Law Centre lecture on anti-suit injunctions. Uh, shipping law often spearheads the development of law in different areas and anti-suit injunctions are no exception. In the tales of the Arabian Nights, uh, there were two brothers, one of whom was Ali Baba, and their father died virtually penniless, and he, did, he split the estate between the two of them, and the book tells us that the fortune should have been equal, but chance determined otherwise. And chance is about what happens in the real world, and anti-suit injunctions are all about adapting to social change. The great book on injunctions, Carr on Injunctions, in 1926, had hardly a word about anti-suit injunctions. And since then, in the Angelic Grace, and then in the Detlev case, and in a number of shipping cases, anti-suits have been developed. And they've had to take into account the needs of the New York Convention, the needs to uh, produce an injunction jurisdiction against non-parties because otherwise orders wouldn't have been effective. And that is now developed so that people can be subject to injunctions against whom there's no cause of action at all and solely for the reason that they hold the keys and that effective relief can be given against somebody uh, else, the defendant. We've now got a person's unknown jurisdiction, and that is as a result of the internet. In order for the anti-suit jurisdiction to have an enforcement jurisdiction against non-parties, we have to have tolerance by overseas courts, we have to be tolerant about interference here, and we have to cooperate. Um, in the anti-suit jurisdiction with shipping, we've got cases where we have people who take advantage of arbitration clauses or contracts subject to them, come and sue somebody elsewhere, and who have to be restrained from doing so inconsistently with the jurisdiction clause. We also have the C premium jurisdiction where people who are not even parties to the arbitration clause or the jurisdiction clause can sue people who themselves are not parties to it. All of this has become very familiar in the United States under the term equitable estoppel. Shipping law is a key developer of anti-suit and indeed law generally because sea law involves vicissitudes and triumphs. We only need to look at another of the tales of the Arabian night, the life of Sinbad. Now, I'm instructed to tell you that uh, participant video and audio have been disabled to minimize interruptions. If you'd like to pose a question or comment, use the Q&A function and we'll either write you a reply or respond during the Q&A session. Uh, alternatively, you can contact the speakers directly following the event. Please note that the webinar will be recorded. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the speakers. Um, the first speaker is somebody who needs no introduction whatsoever, uh, but that doesn't mean that I can avoid my responsibility. Sarah Masters is um, practicing from one of the great shipping chambers, 20 Essex Street. Uh, she is treading, tre treading in the footsteps of the giants, themselves descended from Fort Essex Court um, and its uh, predecessor chambers. Uh, she comes from a set of barristers who are masters in the art and she herself is a master. Then we have Andrew Hutchin, who's a partner in Watson, Farley and Williams. He's hugely experienced in litigation, international and maritime arbitration. He has a strong focus for his practice in shipping. And that means that he isn't solely shipping, 
he also takes note of the rest of commercial law, which is a huge uh, added plus for any shipping lawyer. And then we have uh, Balvinda Alkawala, who started life at Richards Butler. Uh, she qualified there, she's in the Defence Department in London, and she is here to add a tense of reality to the anti-suit jurisdiction as it presently stands, uh, what the problems are, the financial problems, and how God can help in the future. So with that introduction, I'm going to leave the screen for Sarah. And Sarah, do you want to start your, your speech? Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for your kind words. Good evening, everybody. Well, I'm going to start um, a, with a case which is not, a, in fact, not a shipping case at all, um, not least because not only in shipping cases you get anti-suit injunctions, but also um, ex-members of my chambers, I note, were involved in the case, both at First Instance Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. I'm going to talk about the recent decision in Enker and Chubb, and this raised two issues. Um, firstly, it raised issues as to what law governed the arbitration clause, and secondly, issue as to whether or not anti-suit injunction should be granted, though it's fair to say that is not the main issue upon which the case will be remembered. I'll start with a brief summary of the facts to put the case in context. It was a contract for the construction of a power plant in Russia. The um, contract contains a number of provisions stating that Russian law applied to certain provisions of the substantive contract, but no express choice of law. It also contained the substantive contract an ICC arbitration clause providing for arbitration in London. There was a large fire and a claim under the policy. And in May 2009, Chubb, the insurers, commenced a claim before the Russian court against Enka and others, um, claiming for the loss they had paid out. And they contended, Chubb, that the claim was outside the scope of the arbitration clause. The claim for an injunction was brought, an anti-suit injunction was brought before the UK court in September. There was a trial at first instance in December, um, and an anti-suit was refused. On appeal, that was reversed and an anti-suit injunction was granted and that was later upheld by the Supreme Court very recently. It gave judgment at the beginning of October, the appeal having been heard at the end of July um, and upheld the anti-suit injunction, albeit the reasoning was slightly different. Against that background, I'll go and I propose to deal first with the question of the applicable law. And there's three preliminary points here, I think, to bear in mind. The first one is there are three laws in play here that one has to be aware of, and they may not all be the same. Firstly, the law is the law governing the substantive contract. Secondly, there's the law governing the arbitration agreement. And thirdly, there's what's called the curial law um, or the supervisory law, which is the law governing the arbitration procedure. The second preliminary point to bear in mind is the concept of separability, which also plays large here, and that being that arbitration agreements are a separate contract for many purposes. And thirdly, the important um, preliminary point is to remember is that the law applicable to an arbitration clause is not determined by the contract by the contractual choice of law clauses found in the Rome One regulation due to the arbitration exception. Instead, we go back to the rules of the common law, although this makes very little difference in practice, as the Supreme Court recognised in its judgment. So what we're looking at is, is there an express or implied choice of law, the arbitration clause, or alternatively, what law is the arbitration clause most closely connected with? At first instance, Mr Justice Baker held that the arbitration agreement was governed by Russian law, and that he would decline to um, order an, to grant an anti-suit injunction because he thought that the English court should defer to the Russian court on questions such as the scope of the arbitration clause and therefore whether or not the claim made in Russia in the Russian proceedings fell within the scope of that clause. This was reversed by the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal found that although 
there was no choice of law, there was one, there was no choice of law governing the underlying contract. However, there was a strong presumption that the parties had impliedly chosen the law of the seat to govern the arbitration agreement. So therefore, English law applied as the arbitration was seated in London, and on the merits, they decided it was the appropriate case to grant an anti-suit injunction restraining the Russian proceedings, and Julie did so. Now, the Court of Appeal's ruling that English law applied was upheld by the Supreme Court, but it's fair to say it was a close run thing. Um, the judges, the, their lordships um, split three to two, and the reasoning of the majority in favour of the finding that English law was the law of the arbitration clause was a little different. The starting point was the same. They held that if the underlying contract contained a choice of law, that would generally apply to an arbitration agreement. But then they differed from the court below and held that if there hadn't been a choice of law to govern the substantive contract, the choice of the arbitral seat was not on its own enough to justify an inference that the arbitration agreement was intended to be governed by the law of that seat. So therefore, they did not uphold the Court of Appeal's presumption for that to be the case. But nevertheless, they were still prepared to give considerable weight to the choice of seat. And in circumstances where the contract contained no choice of law, they held that the law of seat, the seat, was generally considered to be the place most closely connected with the arbitration agreement. So again, by a slightly different route, they reached the conclusion that English law applied. Now, the minority um, found that the arbitration agreement was governed by Russian law. And this was either because, and this was based on the fact that Russian law was the law governing the main contract, either by implication of choice or because that was the law with which it was most closely connected. So therefore, like the Court of Appeal, the majority of the Supreme Court gave most weight to the law of the seat at the end of the day, although they didn't go as far as elevating it to, uh, it to a presumption. As for the effect of the decision, I think it's fair to say it's been broadly welcomed by, particularly by arbitration practitioners as giving clarity, giving um, primacy to the law of the seat, and also by emphasizing and reinforcing the concept of, um, of the separability of the, under, of the arbitration clause. But that's not to say, I would suggest, that the contribution is not without merit, particularly in considering how businessmen would have may well approach such matters. It seems to me that many businessmen unfamiliar with concepts like separability and other esoteric concepts of arbitration law may well be just surprised to learn that an arbitration clause is governed by a different law from the law govern, governing the contract from which it forms part. Now on the question of the injunction, here um, the Supreme Court spoke with one voice and spoke robustly. They held that the same angelic grace principles apply and the, where the arbitration agreement is governed by foreign law as well as English law. So even if the Supreme Court had concluded that the arbitration agreement was governed by Russian law, it would have been for the English court to decide whether or not the claims made in Russia fell within the scope of the clause, and if so, whether an anti-suit injunction should be granted. They therefore differed from Mr Justice Baker at first instance, who thought that the English court should defer to the foreign court on scope on issues such as scope and validity. Now, there are some other interesting points. The first one, which I think is useful to us practitioners um, as a selling point of the efficiency of English justice is the speed with which the English court dealt with the matter. As I said, the first instance trial and judgment took place towards the end of December, and the supreme judgment came out at the beginning of August. So the speed, I, it was commendable, being a little over nine months. Um, secondly, an important point is the limits, I think, of the injunction. It won't affect anti-suits granted to enforce super the supervisory jurisdiction of the English court. For example, cases where attempts are made to challenge or appeal an award which, an English, which has been made in England, 
Um, and here, the right. So those are just will not be affected by whatever the foreign law, even if a foreign law applies to the arbitration agreement. The reason being that the source of that, those injunctions are the non-mandatory provisions of the Arbitration Act, which the party cannot opt out of by reason of choosing an English seat. And that is what, um, and not the party's agreement to arbitrate at all. And thirdly, the, in ANCA, the issue that arose concerned the scope of the arbitration clause and whether or not the claim in Russia fell within its scope. A number of institutional rules, including the ICC and also the LCIA, provide that the arbitrators have jurisdiction to consider the scope of the arbitration clause. And this raises the issue as to whether or not, in fact, this whole very interesting questions such as the law applicable to the foreign to the arbitration clause could have been sidestepped by merely arguing, well, this was a matter for the arbitrators and the injunction could have been given on that basis as well. Now, next, I'm going to briefly deal with the interesting question of damages for breach of an arbitrational jurisdiction clause. There are two aspects here. Firstly, there is question of legal costs. If you are exposed to claims in a non-contractual jurisdiction, can you recover the cost of dealing with them? The answer to that, I would suggest, is yes. It's relatively straightforward. It should be available from arbitrators or courts, as the case may be. And there are a number of decided cases where these sort of um, damages have been awarded, cases such as the Alexandros T, um, Union Discount and Zola, and also the Dell, some of the Dell cases dealing with non-parties, which I think Andrew may touch on later. The more interesting, and I would suggest difficult question, is if, can you recover substantive damages that you were forced to pay in the foreign jurisdiction, um, in the contractual, on, on the basis that, um, on the basis that had the matter been brought where it should have been, you wouldn't have been exposed to those damages at all. In theory, the principle I would suggest is relatively clear. Such damages should be re recoverable if caused by the breach of the jurisdiction or arbitration clause. However, the matter is not entirely straightforward. Firstly, there is the problem that you would need to prove that the outcome would have been different and more favorable to the damages claimant in the contractual forum than it, than it has turned out to be in a non-contractual forum. Now, this may not be clear cut, particularly if the, if the judgment turns on a mass, on masses of evidence rather than a discrete question of law, such as limitation, um, et cetera. There was a, a quite clever way attempt to get around this about 10 years ago in a case called CMA and Hyundai where the arbitrators awarded damages for breach of um, a arbitration clause in bringing claims in France on the basis that you could simply ignore the French, um, the French judgment because had they parties abided by their contract, it would never have occurred. Now that's, that's one way, um, there may be more orthodox ways to proceed. Second problem is that the decision of the foreign court may give rise to a raised judicata or be entitled to recognition, particularly if the damages claimant contested the merits in the foreign jurisdiction. That then leads to a tight walk, tight road, in, on which parties may need to walk, if, particularly if they decide to defend the claim on the merits. Now, there may be a pragmatic way around this, which is to try and get your damages judgment in first before the English court, um, and before the foreign court gives judgment, even if that only, even if because the foreign court hasn't given judgment, you can only recover declaratory relief or, or the entitlement to an indemnity. However, that then deals, should hopefully deal with um, some of the problems that arise and may also give you a defense under the Brussels recast regulation to, as a shield to the incoming foreign judgment on the basis it's, it's an earlier judgment and it's irreconcilable with the judgment in the foreign forum. The third issue 
to remember though is that the remedies aren't exclusive. You can seek both an anti-suit injunction and also claim damages. And indeed, an anti-suit injunction may increase the efficacy of a claim for damages. There is authority, um, an old place called PASF and Bamberger, and I think more recently in through transport, that a judgment obtained in breach of an anti-suit injunction should not be recognized by the English court on grounds of public policy. So this could be used as another shield to protect your claim for damages before the English court. Finally, a very, very brief word about your Cairns damages. Um, these are equitable damages. Their scope is uncertain. Um, there is quite a lot written about them by the commentators, but they may be very useful, in, particularly in cases where injunctions are sought against non-parties. Now, very, very finally, anti-suit injunctions from arbitration tribunals. Um, I think that my time is coming very much to the end. I've set out a couple of interesting points um, here. I think I will just highlight two. The first, the first issue on anti-suit injunctions from arbitration tribunals is the difficulty of not being able to go ex parte and having to give notice and give the other side a reasonable opportunity to be heard. Um, one of the things that I've learned about anecdotally, but I think that Balvinda may speak about in her presentation, is that anti-suit anti injunctions are a growing practice in China. A lot of the shipping arbitration um, anti-suit injunctions involve claims to restrain proceedings in China. And that I'm told there is a growing tendency that if the other side knows about it, they may seek to get obtain anti anti suit relief from the Chinese court before um, you can get before the arbitrators. And the second issue that I will highlight is this line between ancillary and substantive relief. Um, Traditionally, in the shipping context, there's been a distinction between obtaining security, so such as the arrest of the ship, and then proceeding, which and generally obtaining security is not held being a breach of the underlying um, arbitration or jurisdiction clause, as against proceeding on the substantive merits of the claim, which clearly is. Now, the problem that has arisen is that some jurisdictions may insist on you starting a substantive claim as a precondition to a claim for damage, claim for security. And then what happens if you can't stop the substantive claim and are forced to proceed on the merits um, in order to maintain your security? Now, this was a problem that was touched upon in a recent decision called SRS Middle East and um, Chemi which again is not a shipping case. Um, in actual fact, the point didn't actually arise on the evidence on the case, because it was held that although you had to start substantive proceedings in, I think in the UAE, in order to obtain security, you could stay them or discontinue them and maintain the security. However, the judge, Mr. Justice Baker again, held that if you were forced to make that choice, you would not be held allowed to hold on to your security and proceed on the merits. If the choice was, uh, if you did so, and so if you were forced to give up your security in order um, to proceed your claim in arbitration as you were contractually advised to do, so be it. And if you did not do so, that would not be a good reason to enforce your arbitration clause. Now, I believe that, sorry, that would not be a good reason not to against the grant of an anti-suit injunction. Now, I think I have probably slightly overrun my time, hopefully not too much, um, and I will pass back on to Andrew, who is our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so there's, there's the topic for my talk, anti-suit injunctions, non-party, non-parties delay and Brexit. It's a pretty wide scope and actually, uh, I'm sorry to um, uh, uh, disappoint you all, but in order to talk about, um, uh, um, in order to talk about 
uh, non-parties in uh, anti-suit injunctions. I've got to say a bit about the basic general principle under the angelic grace. And you've heard Stephen, both Stephen and Sarah mention that case. Uh, so the, the, the basic general principle for uh, anti-suit injunctions are, th th these are cases founded on, um, uh, uh, where, where a party can found a, a contractual right not to be sued in a foreign court. So in other words, if you have an exclusive jurisdiction clause where you, you name uh, the, the English High Court as having exclusive jurisdiction, or if you have an arbitration agreement, uh, you, are, you are effectively uh, enforcing a right. It, sorry, and if your counterparty goes off and sues somewhere else, you're effectively enforcing a contractual right not to be sued in a foreign court. And in those situations, the angelic grace principle, what, what it says is that if you can show that there's a high, high likelihood of a breach of an arbitration agreement or a jurisdiction clause um, uh, by, by your counterparty going off to a, a foreign jurisdiction, then an anti-suit injunction will ordinarily be granted. And uh, so that's the first limb. And the second limb is unless uh, there are strong uh, discretionary reasons for the court uh, not, not to order the injunction. And in, in the basic case, straightforward cases, it, it's, it's relatively unusual that provided you act promptly, uh, uh, that uh, the respondent is going to be able to establish a strong reason. But I'll, I'll come on to one of the points, which it can be a strong reason, which is delayed uh, later. But um, so that brings me on to non-parties. So uh, in addition to the basic case, um, uh, which uh, under the angelic grace principles, you have a line of cases uh, basically um, uh, starting perhaps from uh, the J. Bowler, which was in the 1990s, and uh, Lord, Just Lord, Lord Justice uh, Hobhouse, uh, extending through to other cases like uh, more recent cases, such as the use of Sepni Oglio. And, uh, and there is a line of cases now developing, uh, which basically establishes that even though you're not a direct party to the um, uh, to the agreement which has the arbitration agreement or the uh, juris exclusive jurisdiction clause, uh, you can still be subject to, um, uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to the court's jurisdiction, uh, anti-suit uh, injunction jurisdiction. And um, it's interesting because in these cases, um, non-parties can uh, can either be injunction applicants or injunction respondents. And um, the ANCA case, which uh, Sarah's already taken you through, that, that's, a, that's an example of an insurer, a non-party, being, uh, uh, being an injunction respondent. In other words, um, uh, uh, ANCA enforcing, uh, uh, enforcing its arbitration clause took out an anti-suit injunction on the non-party being, uh, uh, being, being the insurer. And it can work the other way, uh, uh, the other way around as well. I mean, the uh, use of Sepni Oglio was a, was a case about uh, a charterer who had a charter party with an owner uh, which had, uh, which was subject to arbitration in London. The charterer um, uh, decided to claim in Turkish courts against the owner's insurer um, uh, under Turkish direct, uh, direct right statutes in Turkey. And uh, the insurer took out an injunction uh, to restrain the charterer from taking those proceedings. So there, that's, that's an example of the other way around. So basically, these cases, um, they, the, 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 court's, the court's jurisdiction is, is, um, 
uh, it appears to be involving and in, in many cases getting wider. So the concept of what third parties can be subject to the court's jurisdiction is, you know, appears to be expanding. So you have the insurance cases where insurers have subrogated rights and uh, don't, uh, don't always seek to um, in, in, in enforce those rights through, uh, 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 through the uh, jurisdiction clause or the arbitration agreements in the subject contract. Uh, you get other cases with assignees, uh, holders of bills of lading, holders of warehouse receipts, um, also being restrained by anti-suit injunctions uh, and being held to the arbitration agreements in those bills of lading, uh, et cetera. So you get those cases and then you get other, you, you get other examples where you know, you have um, you have parties in a charter party chain uh, where, uh, for some reason, um, the uh, the owner will decide that he doesn't want to go for his sub charterer. He wants to, uh, sorry, he doesn't want to go for his charterer, his time charterer. He he wants to take a shot at the sub charterer, and I, I think Sarah was involved in. Uh, one of those cases, which uh, which is the Clear Lake uh, and Gunvor uh, Gunvor Singapore case, in in that situation, the uh, the owner, uh, having loaded a cargo of of, of uh, blended um, was it fuel oil uh, blended fuel oil, um, got into import duty problems with uh, with the Chinese authorities, and decided to. Uh, not to sue Clear Lake, but to go straight for Gunvor, who was the sub charterer. Uh, and in that, in those circumstances, um, the court uh, issued an anti-suit injunction stopping the owners from taking proceedings in Singapore uh, on on the grounds um, on, on the grounds certainly involving Gunvor. I think that uh, that those proceedings were vexatious and oppressive. So, uh, and then you get other examples where. You get parties of you know trying to circumvent and avoid an arbitration agreement by suing employees or suing an agent or manager of ship owners or or, or other shipping parties in their home jurisdictions, which have also uh, given rise to anti-suit injunctions, uh, and you also get parties uh, clearly colluding to bring about the same effects. And taken to extremes, you get parties where who are identified as the sort of principal or mastermind behind the scheme to avoid the arbitration clause, and they too can be subject to anti-suit injunctions. And um, uh, uh, the, the courts have um, sort of developed principles in order to determine. Uh, when these anti-suit injunctions will be issued and, and when they won't be. And the, uh, the main principles of fear are, are um, basically um, the, the second bullet point, which is taking the benefit of an agreement without accepting the burden of the dispute resolution clause. So these are often actions based on derived rights um, uh, uh, from the agreement containing the arbitration clause or the jurisdiction clause. And then you get another uh, another form of these um, uh, uh, these these non-party actions where inconsistent contractual claims are being um, are, are being alleged. So, uh, for example, uh, in the uh, in the Qingdao Huaquan shipping case, which I think was reported last year, uh, you had a situation where there was a settlement agreement. Uh, and uh, the owner was to be paid uh, to, to be paid off for releasing his lien on cargo. Uh, the charterer had a payment agent that was due to make the payment, and the payment agent duly made the payment, and then subsequently claimed the money back from the owner, alleging that there was an oral agreement that uh, this money was refundable to him. So that that's a case where there was a completely inconsistent contractual claim being run in China, um, and uh, it, uh, it it took a while for the owners to work out the basis of the claim, 
but once they realized once, once it was clear that the claim was based on uh, on the settlement agreement itself which had which had a um, uh, English arbitration clause uh, the uh, the injunction was applied for and was granted so these these uh, these cases, a lot of these cases are often uh, described as uh, quasi-contractual cases, and uh, they seem to be coming up as a subject for litigation more and more. So um, uh, there's, alongside these, uh, these two bullet points, there is also the, uh, the, the ground of uh, vexatious and oppressive or unconscionable conduct, which is a, a standalone basis for granting an anti-suit injunction. Um, so uh, that brings me to my next subject. So you you you, you clear the the first angelic grace principle, which is done by analogy, uh, using those principles that I've just covered. Uh, then the question is, can the injunction respondent? The burden shifts to the injunction respondent. Can the injunction respondent uh, give the courts any good reasons uh, why? Um, uh, strong reasons as to why it shouldn't order an injunction. And in these cases, uh, the one that's always raised is that there's been delay in applying for the injunction. The foreign proceedings have gone too far. Um, uh, so and so has, you know, got stuck into the merits in the foreign proceedings, so he's submitted to uh, the jurisdiction. And the point is really that. Um, uh, the longer the foreign proceedings go on, the greater the uh, the risk that uh, the English courts will have to pay uh, uh, pay respect to the what's going on in the foreign court proceedings, uh, and feel that uh, principles of comity and respect for the foreign court get in the way. Also, if the foreign uh, court proceedings has uh, progressed too far, there becomes a risk of inconsistent judgments or, uh, or awards uh, 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 happening. Um, but uh, I think the, the Qingdao uh, Hui Quan shipping case is a good example that it's not just a, uh, a question of time alone. That case went on for about a year in China before the, uh, the injunction was applied for. But uh, the owners were able to show that they had good justification for waiting that time, and uh, and they took advantage of a transfer between two courts. The case hadn't gone that far, um, and they managed to get their anti-suit injunction, notwithstanding that um, uh, you know it was a year after the proceedings were commenced. That brings me on to the Brexit position. Um, if I could just run through these very quickly, so. Um, uh, uh, if I could start off with the forerunner to our, the present uh, 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 the, the present regulation concerning um, uh, uh, jurisdiction, which was the Brussels One Convention, that convention had a strong principle of Liz pendants, where uh, notwithstanding if you had an, an exclusive English court jurisdiction and your counterparty went off to another EU member court. Um, the, the rule was that you, you had you you had to wait for the court first seized to decide the question of jurisdiction, and the English courts couldn't uh, order an anti-suit injunction based on the principle of respect for member state courts, and that proved to be the case not just for anti-suit injunctions for court cases, but also for anti-suit injunctions where. Uh, an arbitration clause had been breached uh, and the counterparty went off to the court. So that was Brussels one. Things improved under the Brussels recast uh, regulation. They did away with the court first seize rule and gave primacy to recognition of, of ex exclusive jurisdiction clauses. And that was mainly to, to or, or, or the major reason was to, uh, to prevent abusive tactics, uh, you know, such as the Italian torpedo tactic, which I've just mentioned, you, uh, in some jurisdictions, they don't decide the jurisdictional question uh, first up. That runs alongside the merits question. So you could be litigating in the foreign court for years before you get your jurisdiction point determined. It was also um, 
uh, uh, confirmed, at least under English law, under the Brussels recast, that uh, that exclusive jurisdiction clauses under that regulation also included asymmet asymmetric clauses where, where one party gets an option to elect for court or, um, uh, court, court or arbitration. Uh, and those, those sorts of clauses are quite common in finance contracts. So moving on to post-Brexit, uh, post um, uh, the English court, uh, uh, the UK has applied to join the Lugano Convention. And uh, indeed the convention was tabled in parliament about two weeks ago for review. The Lugano Convention is, um, is not as advanced as the Brussels Convention uh, sorry, the Brussels recast, and is actually similar to Brussels one. So um, that probably means that if if there is a deal and, and the UK becomes a party to the Lugano Convention, that the uh, the states have to um, uh, take notice of ECJ rulings, and that may mean that you can't get anti-suit injunctions under under that convention either. Uh, if there's no Lugano Convention, the UK is applied to join the uh, Hague Convention on Court Choice of Courts. That convention is very limited, and there are quite a few carve-outs in that convention that are directly relevant to shipping, such as uh, 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 contracts for carriage of goods and also oil pollution cases. Um, so uh, that, court, that, that uh, convention might not give you coverage at all. Uh, but uh, at least you may be able to apply to the English court for anti-suit injunctions uh, under that. And certainly if, if there's no coverage under the Hague uh, Convention, then we go to common law principles where you should be able to apply for anti-suit injunctions. So that brings me to Valvinda. I think you need to switch your mic on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah and Andrew, for setting the scene. Um, I'll be upfront and say that when I was asked to sit on this panel alongside Stephen, Sarah and Andrew, uh, my immediate reaction was to say no. Uh, what could I possibly add to anything that the very people that I'd be instructing to make an anti-suit injunction application? But I realised that at the club, by virtue of the cover that we offer, so it must be remembered under defence, we are dealing with the members' money and under P and I, we're dealing with the club's money. Both will only want to spend that money if it's going to bear some fruit, and therefore, each and every application has to be considered carefully. In short, the conversation that is had on each and every occasion that an anti-suit injunction is considered is: is this a useful tool, or is it just another expensive piece of paper? You'll appreciate that there are numerous numerous considerations that are taken into account. And by virtue of the limited time available to me today, I'm going to concentrate on just three areas which are intended to be illustrative of considerations taken into account. And I apologise in advance if they've been touched upon by Sarah and Andrew, but you'll understand in the context of what I'm going to say, why they're relevant for the purposes of the consideration at the club. So the three considerations are the personal nature of the injunction, the meaning of delay in practice and damages. So turning first to the personal nature of the injunction. So it's important to realise that an anti-suit injunction binds the party against whom it is made. It doesn't bind the foreign court or its proceedings, although it can influence the decisions of the foreign court. In practice, what does this mean? It means that if your intention is that, that the foreign proceedings are halted, then you may not necessarily achieve this. What it does mean is that breach of an anti-suit injunction amounts to contempt of court, which could result in sanctions such as fines, imprisonment and asset seizure. So of course there's a strong incentive to comply and in practice we have found anti-suit injunctions can be a powerful tool resulting in settlement of the matter purely by obtaining the anti-suit injunction and or emphasising the implications of ignoring it. In order to illustrate this point, I'm going to provide you with three examples from practice. The first involves a general cargo ship that grounded in the Dominican Republic. Cargo's share of general, general average was $4 million. 
the Brazilian cargo insurers commenced suit in Brazil against owners, charters and the club in breach of the exclusive English law and jurisdiction clauses in the charters, bills of lading, in the general average bonds and the guarantees. And the intention was to avoid the negligent navigation defence, which is not available in Brazil. An anti-suit injunction was obtained and the English court extended it to suit against owners, charters and the club because of the Himalaya clause in the bills of lading. The multinational insurers had a presence in England and the anti-suit injunction was used to negotiate a 75% general average recovery. So a result. The next case involves alleged salmonella contamination of fish meal. This resulted in the receivers commencing suit in Greece for $3 million. There was an um, apparent uh, inherent vice argument, but it wasn't very attractive to defend that claim in Greece. And so we applied for an anti-suit injunction for breach of the London Arbitration Forum, which had been incorporated in the bills of lading. And ultimately the claim was dropped by the receivers. Another example is where we had a claim by um, Ecuadorian receivers for wet damage to a dry bulk cargo. The liability case was quite straightforward, but a hugely inflated um, quantum meant that there was a dispute which was based on poor segregation and mitigation arguments. An LOU was provided which tied the claim to London arbitration and English law, but Ecuadorian proceedings were commenced by the cargo underwriters and therefore uh, an anti-suit injunction was obtained. The cargo claim was ultimately settled at 50% and we recovered probably 75% of the legal cost. So another result. So these considerations taken into account, in order to avail yourself of this advantage, it does mean that you do need to be prepared to do some investigation where your opponent is concerned. For example, very recently, we've had two cases which on paper appeared identical. They were both soybean claims uh, where the cargoes were found dam damaged upon discharge in China. The receivers in both cases were Chinese entities and the proceedings were commenced in China despite the English law and jurisdiction clauses being incorporated in the respective bills of lading. Anti-suit injunctions were obtained in both cases. One has gone completely silent and in the other we've been paid approximately 90% of the costs that were awarded. What, it, what was the difference you may ask? From our analysis of the two matters, in the one where we recovered our costs, an English law firm had been instructed and we can only surmise that the respondent had been advised of the personal nature of breaching the injunction and possible sanctions as a result. In the other case, there was no engagement at all, and one has to conclude that they have no intention of ever coming to or trading in England. Given the ever increasing global nature of trade, and that a very high percentage of air travel invariably passes through Heathrow, this may be a risky strategy on the part of respondents in the future. There is a 2020 case, Dell Emerging Markets, where the directors of a company and the company itself were found guilty of contempt for breach of the anti-suit injunction where the directors had procured the company to pursue foreign proceedings in breach of an anti-suit injunction. All that being said, even when breached, the anti-suit injunction can be used defensively because it prevent, prevents enforcement of a foreign judgment in England and in any other jurisdictions where the anti-suit is recognised. So, a word of caution. As stated previously, the foreign court and or foreign proceedings are not bound by the granting of an anti-suit injunction and furthermore it can result in adverse findings in some jurisdictions. So whilst the global population now knows where Wuhan is because of the current pandemic we're in, the shipping, shipping lawyers everywhere will know the Wuhan Maritime Court for the granting of an anti-anti-suit injunction as mentioned by Sarah. This was against Clipper Chartering, who'd obtained an anti-suit injunction from the Hong Kong court. The matter subsequently settled, and therefore it's difficult to comment further, but this case does serve as a warning that merely obtaining an anti-suit injunction may well not be enough. And as Sarah mentioned, there is a growing tendency now 
that the Wuhan court is granting anti-anti suit injunctions. And in the same vein, you need to be aware of local laws and policies that may defeat your express choice of law and forum agreement. For example, Washington state is one of a number of states in the USA that has anti-choice of law and forum statutes and policies which undermine parties express contractual agreements. Turning now to Dylan, which I know both Sarah and Andrew have touched upon, but as with all matters legal, there's no clear definition of the word delay in the context of anti-suit injunctions. You will hear it be said that delay at your peril if proceedings are commenced in contravention of your express law and jurisdiction clauses. At first glance, this appears to be a straightforward instruction, and it should not be difficult to understand in the context of where foreign proceedings are threatened or commenced, and we would always advise our members to confirm in writing to their opponents that they are disputing foreign jurisdiction and to keep reiterating the fact that they are not submitting to the foreign jurisdiction. In 2019, the Commercial Court, in a case involving the vessel Joker, provided some helpful clarification on how a party should act when it faces proceedings in a foreign jurisdiction in contravention of an exclusive law and jurisdiction agreement and subsequently seeks relief from the English court. The background facts are unsurprising. The vessel was on time charter on the NYPE form and the sub voyage charter was on the Euromed charter party form. The vessel was carrying soybean meal from Brazil to Bangladesh under a congen bill. Upon approaching the berth in Bangladesh, Bangladesh, a chain from the anchor of a tanker became entangled in the propeller of the joker, resulting in penetration of one of the vessel's holds, leading to an ingress of seawater and damage to cargo. Receivers started proceedings for cargo damage in the Bangladesh court and obtained an arrest order. Owners successfully obtained a mandatory interim injunction from the English court, which restrained the receivers from taking further steps in Bangladesh, pending a final hearing in England. The guidance from the commercial court amounted to, one, it's critical not to take substantive steps in the other forum, in particular the finding that obtaining release of an arrested vessel does not equate to such, such submission. The respondents had tried to argue that by making an application for release, the owners had submitted to the Bangladesh court. Two, that it's crucial that relief from the English court is sought as soon as possible and without delay. And three, any steps taken in the foreign proceedings will be taken in context. Interestingly, there is a 2018 decision where relief was sought after a year of the foreign proceedings being commenced. In usual circumstances, it's possible to conclude that there has been delay. But what was interesting in this case, which is the case that Andrew uh, referred to was that the party that commenced the foreign proceedings was not a party to the law and jurisdiction agreement but was suing under that agreement and the claimant had intentionally waited for the foreign court to make that finding before seeking relief from the English court and the anti-suit injunction was granted. In the case of SRV Bank of China which is a 2015 case a delay of nine months was considered to be far too long against a backdrop of a 12 month time bar and therefore the anti-suit injunction was refused. So turning to the question of damages, as has been mentioned there are two limbs to this. Ultimately the claimant's aim is to use the anti-suit injunction to enforce an agreement to sue in one jurisdiction and not in any others. The other remedy is damages for the breach of the arbitration or jurisdiction agreement. The most obvious loss being the additional legal costs and expenses in taking countermeasures, hiring foreign lawyers, etc. But what happens if the proceedings are not halted and the breaching party obtains an award that it would not have obtained had it been in the contractual jurisdiction? In a recent case, which is one of a number pending in the Wuhan Maritime Court, receivers were awarded their full claim plus interest and court fees amounting to approximately three and a half million dollars and all subsequent appeals were without success so the final judgment plus interest and court fees which has been paid out under protest amounted to approximately four million dollars. Two routes for recovery have been identified by uh, IOS. The first is a declaration by the tribunal in a London arbitration between owners and receivers under the bills of lading, 
that owners have no liability to the receivers and owners were awarded damages for the amounts paid in China. And secondly, a London High Court judgment has been obtained against the Chinese cargo insurer for approximately $4 million as damages for procuring and or inducing a breach of contract by continuing the Wuhan Maritime Court proceedings. The reason for this is because whilst you can get an anti-suit injunction against the insurer, they are not technically a party to the arbitration agreement. And rather surprisingly, they only take subrogation subject to an equity to comply with the arbitration agreement. This means that the arbitration award for all the monies paid out in China will not bind the subrogated insurer. And instead, you need to start separate proceedings against them. In our case in the court in London, in tort for breaching and or procuring the breach of the arbitration agreement, in which we obtained damages for the amount that we'd been forced to pay out. So, in conclusion, as with all litigation, having such judgments, awards, injunctions is all well and good, but are they just expensive pieces of paper when enforcement is impossible? In a way, we have come full circle to my initial point. You need to put in some work to see where your opponent trades or intends to trade or has a presence. Contempt of court does not have an end point, so it may be that waiting is the name of the game. My key takeaway for you today is to take advice immediately upon receipt of a threat to or actual breach of your contractual agreement. Delay can defeat an anti-suit injunction, and whilst general principles can be taken from case law, every case is highly fact-dependent and do some digging on your opponent. You never know when you may be able to strike. Noble Sue was arrested in 2019 for a 2014 judgment for which he was held to be in contempt of. Thank you for listening. Handing back to Stephen. Okay, well look, thank you very, very much to our panelists. I, I will give them a round of applause. And I'm sure that uh, the 183 participants uh, will authorise me to thank them uh, very, very much for their presentations. Now, we've had a, a great question from Mr Justice Andrew Baker, uh, which is this. The Supreme Court majority decided in Enker and Chubb on the basis that the arbitration agreement was governed by English law. Does that mean that the approach to be taken where the real dispute is whether the promise to arbitrate extends to a particular claim that has been brought and the governing law of the arbitration agreement is the law of the jurisdiction where that claim has been brought remains undecided? And if so, what do you think the approach should be? Uh, Mr Justice Andrew Baker is of course entirely correct about the scope of the Inca decision in the Supreme Court. Um, the English court always applies its own conflicts of law rules uh, to a particular dispute. Uh, that is part of English law. Um, English court will have a pacta sunt servanda policy. And that is in general our policy in these cases. A local jurisdiction may well have a quite different public policy or a quite different take upon what the answer should be in a particular situation. And the situation which is postulated, although it is the background is ENCA, it can apply in many different cases with different contexts. Um, in the ENCA case, one of the problems was that there was a tort and there was a question as to whether there was a single tort and whether everybody could take advantage of the arbitration clause and the Russian law uh, was not all that supportive of the idea that the person who would contracted could take advantage of it. Now English courts are very used to deciding questions of foreign law uh, nowadays, we have experts, it can be done relatively cheaply, but we also have in England a very strong public policy of defending London arbitration. And that is not simply because of selfishness on our own economic interests um, or to give arbitrators greater employment. It's because London operates as a neutral forum and where people have agreed London as a neutral forum, we should do everything that we can to make sure that the issues are decided in London 
And that is the basis for Lord Hoffman's analysis in West Tankers. So to this question, I would say there is no single general answer. Each case is going to turn on its own particular facts. facts. But if we have a bias towards saying it's the English commercial court that should decide, it's a very good court, it should decide, unless there is some special reason to the contrary, and in particular it should do so in order to uphold people's contracts and in order that people who have chosen a neutral forum will have that neutral forum deciding the issue that's been identified. But whether that is so generally in all cases, I would question. So that's my answer. Andrew, what do you think? I, I, I agree with you, Stephen. I, I, I do... Um, um, I, I do have some sort of um, uh, concerns about what's going to happen when when we get these um, sort of large disputes in uh, uh, in anti anti suit injunction proceedings uh, on questions of foreign law and uh, leaving the English court to, to to sort those out because I remember when this firm did. Um, uh, did the Dalla case, which was actually on enforcement, uh, that went right up to the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, they, they wrote pages and pages on what French law uh, meant in relation to that case and, and, and worked it out all very logically. And the French Court of Cassation, uh, Cassation then turned around, you know, six months later and said, that isn't French law, you know. And, and I just... Um, and therefore, um, I'm not sure really whether this was uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker's uh, question, but I, I, I do um, I, 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 I do actually wonder about having these the, the, these questions decided in in anti-suit injunctions about you know foreign law and and the scope of uh, what, what the scope of the arbitration clause is. Sarah, do you want to say some words about this? You'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, no, not really. I think I think that um, your approach, Stephen, is certain is certainly one that commends itself. I wonder if you do defer to the foreign jurisdiction. You're adding another layer on the already um, multiple icing on the cake here, um, adding further delay and further cost. And what happens if the foreign court decides in your favour? Will it then be too late to get an anti-suit injunction? But I agree that it's that it's a it's, there's no one size fits all solution here. I mean, I'm, and I also point about um, about the cost um, and the amount and the the amount of evidence and complexity of the evidence that is often put forward in such cases. And I'm, I'm aware that it's a slightly different context to the recent decision of Mr. Justice Turner um, in, the, in the Brazil Dams case, where clearly he was getting very concerned about how much evidence he had to deal with on an interlocutory jurisdiction challenge. And I know that Mr. Justice Andrew Baker has also expressed uh, some views, particularly about getting um, proper directions for expert evidence in the, in the uh, Belvinda, do you want to say something about this as, as well? No, I think it's all been said. Thank you. Well, 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 it's a great privilege to have had this question from a, a sitting judge, particularly in relation to a case that he's sat on. And we're very delighted that he's asked it at uh, our conference. And we would like to thank him for doing so. Now, we've had another question, which is from Robert Gay. Um, he has said that Andrew said that anti-suit injunctions have been obtained to prevent proceedings against employees. Um, how is this done, even if there is a Himalaya clause? Uh, then under the Mat Mahutai, uh, and the question is spelling, uh, many standard Himalaya clauses, the employee cannot rely on the arbitration clause in the contract. So that the point is, that the employee doesn't necessarily have the benefit of the clause. So how on earth can you stop the proceedings against your local manager, in the case of a shipping line, perhaps your local P&I representative, in the case of Balbinda, or an employee 
who happens to get in the firing line of the foreign court. Andrew, what would you, would you like to do this one? Uh, um, I have actually, Dex, uh, I, I, I've been quick to pass this on to Sarah through our internal chat. So I just thank her in advance for dealing with that one for me. Okay, Sarah, you're the expert. <laughs> um, I think the answer is there's a number of ways that you may be able to do that. Um, and it's happened on a number of occasions. There was a quite an early case of, um, called the Horn Bay, in which Mr Justice Morrison had absolutely no difficulty in injuncting claims brought, uh, brought by a manager on the basis that he thought it was just a try on to get around the jurisdiction clause. So I think it's fair to say that the sort of the reasoning in that case was not, was not particularly um, detailed. But it seems to me that there are a number of ways you can do this. Firstly, if as a matter of the construction of the relevant jurisdiction clause or the arbitration clause, it can be held to benefit third parties, you can actually rely on the clause. And we had that in a case I was involved in called Dell and I.B. Morocco, and it was held that on the matter of the construction of the clause, it extended to claims brought by third parties, and that brought against third parties, and that was affiliates and agents. But I think there's also a growing um, jurisprudence, more generally, that the court is, is increasingly more readily prepared to intervene if they think that it's a, a try on and it's an attempt, a, a blatant attempt to circumvent a, a jurisdiction clause or an arbitration clause. Um, um, that we see that the, the Clear Lake case, which I hesitate to uh, refer to given I was, the, I was acting as the party who were found to have uh, blatantly tried to, uh, to circumvent the jurisdiction clause by bringing a claim in tort rather than contract up and down the contractual chain. But we also see it, there's the recent decision of the name of A3 that Stephen will know, of the decision of Mrs Justice Cockrell, where she tries to give some shape, more shape to the law in this area about third parties and vexation and oppressive. And I do wonder whether or not there is a growing move now towards a more sort of general, general equitable doctrine, though it's still being developed and, and, um, and we should see what happens in the future cases. I mean, I, I was going to... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Can I finish? That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Um, I was just going to add two words on this. Um, the first is that you can have clauses as between A and B, uh, where uh, B promises not to sue A's employees. But then you get the problem about privity of contract and whether the employee can, um, can rely on it direct. But there's no reason why A shouldn't enforce it by injunction. Um, and he can get anti-suit in respect of his employee. Now, those, those clauses, uh, there have been a number of cases about the clauses, and the English courts don't likely infer that that is the deal. Um, the second area is that you get cases where it says, well, look, this is just oppressive to sue the employee. Um, the days have passed uh, since uh, the, uh, the lady who went on the cruise ship from St. John's Wood uh, could sue the boatswain for negligence when she couldn't sue the ship owner, Adler and Dixon. Um, we're now much more sophisticated and actually bringing these claims against employees or the local managers is simply a way of circumventing the deal that you've done. Uh, and the, the, um, what you've done is oppressive and unconscionable and is subject to the anti-suit jurisdiction, not as contractual, but on the basis of non-contractual and acting oppressively and unconscionably in the true equitable chancery sense. So, that's as far as I think we can take it at the moment. Um, we've got a, another question from Yvonne Batts, uh, who of course is the professor. And um, I was wondering who of our panelists would like to answer that. She's asked, post-Brexit, the 2005 Hague Convention will apply to many maritime contracts, but not as Andrew stated to bills of lading, where the common law rules will apply. See, for example, HIN Pro. Um, 
unless we get the Lugano Convention, which I don't think we'll get by 11 p.m. on the 31st of December. We shouldn't need an anti-suit injunction where the Hague Convention applies unless a contracting state fails to stay in favour of the English court closing. Is it likely that in those circumstances the English court would grant an anti-suit injunction? Now, who, Andrew, do you want to do that or? Yes, thanks. Um, okay. Uh, Steve. I, I, um, um, my, I, I don't know, of course, it's, it, it, it's, um, it, it, it's a big question as to how the English courts are going to um, uh, take the Hague Convention, in, you know, when they're deciding as uh, uh, when they're deciding on whether to grant an anti-suit injunction or not. Um, but I, I would say that um, uh, not standing the, 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 in a court in a Hague Convention country, if there's been a clear breach of contract or breach of arbitration agreement. Uh, and it, it's applied for promptly. I, I, I don't think I don't see what would should restrain an English court from making an anti-suit uh, ordering an anti-suit injunction. As we've already made clear, it, it, it's it's not against the uh, it's it's not against the foreign court. It's a, it, it, it's a personal remedy against the counterparty. And I I I, I don't immediately see why just because we've uh, just because the UK is a party to the Hague Convention, it, it, you know, the, the, um, the injunction applic applicants should, should just sit there and wait, uh, um, you know, until it gets into a real mess if, if the court doesn't stay the, stay the action. So I, I, I'd, uh, I'd, say, I'd say yes, basically, that, you know, I, I, I would think the court would, would grant an injunction. Sarah, do you, do you want to say anything? No. I think it may be. I think it may be more difficult in circumstances where they refuse to stay, because in those circumstances you've got questions of delay and other discretionary factors, and whether or not there are comity considerations for the, the proceedings to um, go on. Yeah. C can I help on this for a moment and say this? Um, the Hague Convention is very similar to the New York Convention for arbitration clauses. There are differences. Um, as we've heard, there are certain situations that are excluded from the Hague Convention, um, not bills of lading, but there are others. Uh, they include, include employment contracts are excluded. Now, we can't in England uh, grant injunctions where the battle is between state A or jurisdiction A and jurisdiction B, and we're just being asked to act as a global policeman. But that is not the situation that Yvonne has postulated. It's not an Airbus type situation. It's a situation where somebody is breaking the covenant. It's in relation to litigation in a foreign court where they've gone to another court uh, in order to litigate a dispute that they've agreed to um, litigate in the Hague Convention uh, jurisdiction. And there it is very well established that the common law court, even though it's not the court of the forum under the clause, can grant an injunction on angelic grace principles and will do so in order to hold the person to his promise. Uh, and that was uh, originally decided in a, in a judgment actually in the Caribbean, but it was given by Lord Justice Chadwick as a visiting judge. And as far as I'm aware, that's, that judgment's never been questioned. And that would certainly be of high persuasive authority uh, on the question that Yvonne has asked. So we've come up to 25 to seven. People have got to go home. Um, I would very much like to thank our panelists once again. Um, thank you to our audience for taking the time to join us today. Uh, if you have any further questions on uh, anti-suit injunctions, feel free to reach out to myself or any of the speakers uh, directly. Um, and if you've dialed into the webinar, uh, please email shipping at shippinglbc.co.uk so we know that you attended and you'll get your points for your respective regulatory authority. So with that, thank you again. 
and um, we very much hope that you'll come to the next shipping law seminar which um, is planned. Thank you very much indeed.